Today's lecture is on basic operations on vectors and matrices. We'll start with some notation and remarks. So first of all, we are going to model the vector and matrix operations on the operations that we have for scalars. And for scalars, if you remember, it's equality, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And we will assume that for scalars, we know exactly what these operations are. They are the arithmetic that we've learned long ago. Now, a reminder about the notation. We have vectors in the scalars f of size n, uh, written as u1, u2, un, an ordered list of scalars with one index. We'll abbreviate that a little bit by writing u sub i from i equals 1 to n. For matrices, we have a similar convention. The matrix A is a rectangular layout of scalars, M rows, and N columns. And so we'll write this as A is equal to our template parameters A sub I, J, and I runs from 1 to the number of rows M, J runs from 1 to the number of columns N. And if you know the sizes M and N, We'll simplify this further by simply writing that u is equal to u sub i in fn and a is equal to a sub i j in fm by n. Now that we've got this notation out of the way so that it doesn't look as clumsy in what I'm going to write next, let's define a few operations. And the very first one we're going to look at is equality uh, between these objects. So let's start with a vector u and a vector v in uh, scalars f, so typically our rational numbers, and there's n of them. Both of these vectors have the same size. We'll say that these two vectors are equal if and only if, uh, if I write u equals v, what I mean is that the first entry of u is equal to the first entry of v, second entry of u is equal to the second entry of v, last entry of u is equal to the last entry of v. So the corresponding entries are equal. For matrices, I'll make the exact same definition. But I'll say that two matrices are equal if I can write m times n scalar equations of the form the entry ij in matrix A is the same as the ij entry in matrix B. So two remarks here. The matrices and vectors on either side of the equal sign must be the same size. If they're not the same size, we cannot say that they're equal under any circumstances. So don't be tempted to add or remove a row of zeros, for example. The other remark that's important here is that equality lets us convert vector and matrix equations into a set of scalar equations. Look here. The vector u is equal to the vector v. Well, that's the set of simultaneous equations, scalar equations. u1 is equal to v1, uh, u2 equals v2, etc. n equations. And lastly, an example just to show you how this works, I've written a matrix x here equal to this matrix of the same size. And therefore, what that equal sign means is that the corresponding entries x11 is equal to 3 x12 is equal to square root of 2, etc., for each one of the six entries in these matrices. Now that I've got equality down, I'm going to define addition using equality and scalar addition. So suppose I've got two vectors of the same size again, so ui and vi, and the size is n. Then what I'll do is I'll define the sum of those two vectors by simply adding the corresponding terms. So u1 plus v1 all the way to un plus vn. Now, in terms of the scalar equations that I'm getting is if I look at u plus v at the ith entry in u plus v over here on the right hand side, it's equal to the ith entry in u plus the ith entry in v on the left side. For matrices, it's the exact same definition. The sum of two matrices is simply going to be that the ij entry in the sum is going to be the sum of the corresponding entries in the matrix A and the matrix B. So if I give you a matrix example, I've got two matrices here, a matrix with parameters x1 through z2, 
and I'm adding a matrix of the same size, then what I get to do is simply add the corresponding entries. So x1 plus 1, y1 plus 2, z1 plus 3, etc. The remarks then is the, the most important part of this uh, definition is that the only way that those operations are defined is if the vectors and matrices are the same size. Otherwise, no, no such thing. And a theorem that goes with that that will prove quite useful is if I take two uh, vectors, u and v, of the same size, and a vector c of the same size, then if u is equal to v, what I can do is I can simply add the same vector c on both sides and equality will be maintained. Now, how do we show that that is true? Well, it's quite simple. We'll use the properties that we've defined so far, namely the properties of equality. Start with now my notation. I typically give a statement a name. So here, C in parentheses means a statement. Whenever I say C, the equivalent sign means what I mean is U plus C is equal to V plus C. That's my statement C. So if I say U plus C is equal to V plus C, I've just said C. So we've named our equation. Now what I'll do with this equation, and since I've given it a name, I can just save space and simply write the logical progression that I'm getting. So U plus C is equal to V plus C. If I use the definition of equality, that means I now have N equations. Now the looking at the entries. So the entry in number i is ui plus ci is equal to vi plus ci for all possible indices from 1 to n. That's just the definition of equality. Now, this is an algebraic equation. I don't know how algebraic equations work. I know that I can subtract off ci from both sides and therefore that that is equal to ui is equal to vi for all of the i's again property of the scalar equation. Now, since I have that for all of the entries i, I can use the definition of equality again and go back to vectors and write that that is u is equal to v. So the way something like this works is I write the statement, and then I'm using the theorems and definitions that I already have. In this case, it was the definition of equality. Uh, drop down to a set of scalar equations, manipulate my scalar equations, and go back to vector equations by the definition of equality. Matrices work exactly the same way. If I have three matrices of the same size A, B, and C, then if A is equal to B, I can add C to both sides, and of course it goes in reverse as well. If I have A plus C is equal to B plus C, I can simply drop the C on both sides and get A is equal to B. And for multiplication by a scalar, which we're about to define uh, below, uh, that will work the exact same way, that we can take an equation U is equal to V and multiply by some number on both sides and similarly for matrices. So let me tell you what these operations really mean. And it goes like this. If I have a vector u and a scalar, then I'm defining scalar times that vector by simply saying that the ith entry in that product is going to be the ith entry in the vector multiplied by u. Same thing holds for matrices, that I simply take the coefficient that sits out front, here alpha times the, ma times the matrix, and take it inside the matrix by multiplying each of the entries. So to show it to you, here, the scalar 3 times this matrix 2, 1, 3, x, y, z. Take the 3 and multiply it into each one of the entries. So 2 times 3 is 6, 1 times 3 is 3, 3 times 3 is 9, and similarly for the second column, 3 times z is equal to 3z, for example. So now I've got two operations. I've got addition and I've got scalar multiplication. I can use these to define subtraction. Simply, u minus v, if I have a vector u and a vector v of the same size, I'll define u minus v as the following. Take the vector v, multiply it by the scalar minus 1, and then add that to u, so u plus minus 1 times v. 
that's what u minus v will mean. For matrices, I make exactly the same definition that A, a matrix A minus a matrix B of the same size, of course, that that is equal to A plus the scalar multiplication of B by that scalar minus 1. As an example, therefore, I simply get that 1, 2, 3, 3, 2, 1 minus the matrix 1, 1, 1, all 1s, is take each one of the entries in the first matrix and subtract out the corresponding entry in the second matrix. So 1 minus 1 is equal to 0, 2 minus 1 is equal to 1, etc. Now that I have scalar multiplication and addition and subtraction, let's look at the system of equations example. And this one is going to prove extremely important. Look at the following. I'll set up a system of equations. I'll call it C again. So I've got the two equations, 3x plus 2y plus z equals 5, and 4x minus y plus 2z equals 3. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use the definition of equality to simply make this statement, uh, two statements with an equal sign, into a corresponding statement about vectors. The vector with whatever is on the left equal to the vector with whatever is on the right by the definition of equality. I've got two vectors. Now I'm going to use the definition of addition to break this vector up uh, one step at a time. So I can look at the vector 3x, 4x, plus the vector 2y plus z minus y plus 2z, and then break that second vector up again to get 3x, 4x for the first vector, plus 2y minus y for the second vector, plus z, 2z for the third vector. So you see I've, I've kept the x's in one vector, the y's in the second vector, and the z's in the third vector, equal to the right-hand side. Now what I'll do is I'll use the definition of scalar multiplication to pull out that common factor x and common factor y and common factor z from each one of these vectors, and I get x times the vector 3, 4, plus y times the vector 2 minus 1, plus z times the vector 1, 2, adds up to 5, 3. So if you look at my system here, you'll see that the multipliers of x, that's in my first vector, the multipliers of y, that's in my second vector, and the multipliers of z is in my third vector, equal to the right-hand side. So I've transformed my system of equations. What I started out with originally, if you think about it uh, from your other courses, you'll recognize that as two planes. So I've got two planes defined here, and I'm talking about the intersection of those two planes if I want numbers that satisfy these equations. Originally, my system looks like the intersection of two planes. And by the time I'm done, it looks like the addition of vectors with some scale factors. And if I figure out the scale factors just right, the, what x is supposed to be, what y is supposed to be, what z is supposed to be, and that addition adds up to my right-hand side. So two very different geometrical interpretations of that system. Now, that suggests two very important definitions that will prove extremely important. They'll come up again and again. So the first one is to look at the form that I actually ended up with for my system of equations. I ended up with constant vectors, 3, 4, 2 minus 1, 1, 2, and arbitrary multipliers, x, y, and z. So the first definition I'm going to make is whenever I see an expression like this, a constant times a vector plus a constant times a vector plus a constant times a vector, uh, we'll call that a linear combination of vectors. In the game, my vectors have, all, have to be all the same size, so the precise definition is if I give myself k vectors all of the same size and a corresponding set of k scalars, then if I multiply that first scalar by the first vector, second scalar by the second vector, last scalar by the last vector, and I add up all these resulting vectors, that's a linear combination of vectors. So I have a linear combination of vectors here with arbitrary x, arbitrary y, and arbitrary z, whatever they happen to be. 
if I stick various values of x, y, and z into this expression, I'm going to get different right-hand sides, right? So what are all possible right-hand sides that I could get if I let x, y, and z take on any values? So we'll give that concept a name as well. We'll start with a given set of vectors v1 through vk, all of the same size. We'll call the span of these vectors the set of all possible linear combinations of these vectors. So if I form a linear combination, alpha 1 v1 plus alpha 2 v2 plus alpha k vk, I get a vector. And if I change the alphas to some other alphas, I get other vectors. And all possible alphas that I can plug in there, I get the span of these vectors. Now, let me just break this mathematical notation here up into pieces for you. The curly brace on either side simply means a collection, a set. So curly brace means I have a collection of them. Then the very first thing I'm going to write out is an exemplar, is placeholder, something that is in the set. And I'll put in a bar. And on the other side of that, I'm going to describe what that exemplar has to look like to be in this set. So this W, this exemplar, has to be a linear combination of the vectors for all possible coefficients alpha in my scalars f. So next, let's talk about some properties of these operations. And we'll divide them into two. We'll talk about the algebraic properties and then the geometric representation of these operations. So again, we have this dichotomy, the algebra and what the algebra tells me, and the geometry, what the geometry tells me. Let's start with the algebra. And we'll write it as a big theorem. All it really says is I can do algebra the way I'm used to. So if I take uh, vectors all of the same size, so if u, v, and w are any vectors in my set of vectors, uh, scalars f, size of the vectors n, and I take any scalars alpha and beta in that set of scalars, then I have the following property. First one, called commutativity, u plus v, the order doesn't matter. u plus v is the same as v plus u. The second operation, associativity here, is that parentheses aren't really needed. If I take u and v and add them together and get a new vector, u plus v, and then I add the vector w to that new vector, I get a vector. If I do the operation differently, if I start with v and w and add those up, and I get a new vector, and then add u to that vector, I get the same result on both sides. And so, no, I don't need the parents. The next property here, there's a zero uh, vector. Big mathematical notation that inverted E means there exists. So there exists a vector zero in Fn. There exists that E, a vector zero that is a member of the set Fn, that is a vector with n entries. And that inverted E means such that, a property that that vector must have. So there's a zero vector, and it has the property that if I take U and I add that zero vector to it, I get U. So U plus zero equals U. Well, that sounds familiar, just a big fancy description of that. Similarly, there is something that we'll call an additive inverse inside my set of vectors and the property it has is that if i take u and i add the additive inverse i get the zero vector well in scalars it would be alpha minus alpha equals zero there, there's a minus alpha that will add up to zero so that's the properties of addition that we want similarly for scalar multiplication i've got a bunch of properties over here the distributivity of the scalar multiplication over a vector addition. So on the left here, I have take a vector u and a vector v, add them together, and take that sum, that new vector, and multiply it by alpha, scale it by alpha. On the other side, I do something different. I take my vector u, I scale it by alpha, I take my vector v, and I scale it by beta, 
And then I'll add those two scaled vectors together, and I get the same thing on both sides. Okay, so I can simply take the alpha and multiply it in whenever I have a parenthesis. Similarly, if I have addition of two scalars, if I take my scalar and I break it, break it into two pieces, alpha and beta, and I multiply that into V, well, again, that distributes over my property. So I can take the vector V and multiply it inside a sum of scalars. Same thing holds for multiplication. I can take the vector U, scale it by beta, take this new scaled vector and scale that by alpha. Or I can multiply alpha and beta together, scalars, and scale my vector u by that product. And I get the same property. So what's important here is that I don't really need the parentheses. I can take my vector u, scale it by beta, take the result, scale it by alpha, or I can simply multiply alpha and beta together and then scale my vector u by that product. The last property I need is 1 times v, the scalar 1 times v doesn't change v, it's just equal to v. So, basic properties, and before I tell you the end result of this, is I'll point out that there seem to be a couple of properties that are missing, and here they are. The first part of it is that that zero vector that has to exist is unique. It's just a vector of all zeros, zero, 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 n of them, same size. The scalar product, the number zero times any one vector u is equal to the zero vector. So on the left here, that's the scalar zero. On the right here, that is the vector of with n zero enters. So zero times u is equal to zero. And finally, the additive inverse is nothing but the scalar minus 1 multiplied by u. u minus u is equal to 0. In terms of matrices, I can write the exact same theorems for matrices. So instead of u, v, and w in uh, vectors of size n, I'll make them matrices of size m by n, and then everything else looks exactly the same. To show that the additive inverse is unique, well, let's assume we have two additive inverses, u1 tilde and u2 tilde, and therefore u plus u1 tilde is equal to zero, and u plus u2 tilde is equal to zero. So two vectors associated with u, such that when I add u to that vector, I get zero. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to try and combine both u1 tilde and u2 tilde in a single equation. So let's start with this. u1 tilde, we know from the existence of the zero that I can write u1 tilde as u1 tilde plus zero. And the moment I realize that I can write it that way, I can look at equation number two and say, well, zero is equal to u plus u tilde. So let's plug that in. Uh, now I have u1 tilde and u2 tilde in the same equation. Now let's simply reparenticize the expression and get u1 tilde plus u plus u2 tilde. But u1 tilde plus u we know is equal to zero, and therefore we plug that in and use the fact that zero plus u2 tilde is equal to u2 tilde to finally get that u1 tilde is equal to u2 tilde. There's only one such vector. The expression I wrote here, u1 tilde equals u1 tilde plus zero, is a complete sentence. Right? It's mathematical notation, but listen to it. u1 tilde is equal to the quantity u1 tilde plus zero. When I then proceed equals, 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 I'm modifying this one sentence. Uh, the next line reads, u1 tilde is still equal to u1 tilde plus u plus u2 tilde. So I'm modifying a single sentence as I go down the stack, as opposed to the equivalent signs where we were changing sentences altogether. Now, what all of those theorems, all they really add up to is that with vectors and matrices, I can do algebra exactly the same as for scalar algebra. 
So I can solve an expression like 3u plus 2v minus 6x equals 3x minus v for x simply by manipulating my uh, equations the way I'm used to. The way I've done it here is I've been a little bit short. I really should do it one step at a time and point to the appropriate integral. I really should do it one step at a time and point to the appropriate uh, part of the theorem. Uh, but the, uh, basically all we are really doing is pulling x to one side and u and v to the other side. So if you look, if I pull that 6x over to the other side, I get 9x. And therefore, eventually, I'll have to divide through by 9 and get that x is equal to one third of u plus one third of v. And I can do this for vectors. u, v, and x are vectors of the same size. I can write the exact same manipulation for matrices if u, v, and x happen to be matrices of them. Looking at the geometrical representation, vector addition and subtraction, I hope you uh, remember from your physics courses, it's simply the parallelogram law. That is, I'm taking a vector u, I'm adding it to a vector v, I can do it two ways. I can take u and draw v from the endpoint of u and simply connect the final endpoint and the start point, and that's u plus v. Or I can fill out the parallelogram if I take u and v starting at the same point and connecting the origin to the opposite side gives me u plus v. Connecting the endpoint minus the starting point is v minus u. The real point is that this construction is flat. If I put u and v on the ground, in, even though I'm in three dimensions, and I add u and v, the resulting vector is still on the ground. I can't get off the ground. It lies in a plane, the plane defined by u and v. Let's now look at linear combinations of vectors. And my first example is to simply look at the vector 1, 2, and I'm going to multiply it by constant alpha, and I'm going to change alpha. A little bit. So I'm looking at the span of the vector 1, 2 as I change alpha from minus infinity to plus infinity. Here's a little bit of code. All it really does is it gives me this plot here and the slider to change alpha. So the red vector here, that's my u vector. It starts at the origin and it ends up at 1, 2. Alpha is the multiplier, and the result of applying alpha to u shows me the endpoint is a blue dot. So right now the alpha is equal to zero. So zero times u is equal to zero. I'm at the end. If I now move alpha, say I multiply it by one half, then I'm at half the length of u. I multiply it by one, I'm at one times u. Multiply by 1.5, I'm at 1.5 times the length of u multiplied by 2, uh, 2 and a half, 3, 3 and a half, 4. You see that I'm getting uh, points that lie on the line defined by u. When alpha is negative, it simply switches the direction in the opposite direction. If I refine the alpha, so I'll simply show you plots for uh, different choices of alpha. So here, same plot as before, the alpha values I have is 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And therefore, at 0, I get the origin. At 1, I get 1 times u. At 2, I get 2 times u, 3 times u, 4 times u. I get 4 points on the line that the vector u lies on. If I make alpha smaller, if I uh, take 0, 0 0.25, 0 0.50, etc., what you see is at 0.25, I'm at a quarter of the length of u. At 0.5, I'm half the length of u. And so I'm getting a denser set of points on that same interval from 0u to 4u. If I refine it even more, and now I'm starting at minus 4, so I go from minus 4 to 4 with 0.25, I'm getting the line segment along the line that goes from minus 4 times u on this end to plus four times u on that end. Making the steps in alpha even smaller, so here it's point 0.1. As I go from minus 4u to plus 4u, I'm filling in more and more and more of that line segment. So alpha times u is 
points on the line and if I change my uh, range of alpha to go from minus infinity to plus infinity, alpha times u is the whole line that lies in the direction of Let's now take two vectors. Now I've changed my u vector to 1, 0, so it's easier to interpret. It's just the x-axis. But I'm going to look at alpha times 1, 0 plus beta times 1, 4. So if I let alpha and beta take on all possible values, that would be the span of the vectors 1, 0 and 1, 4. And again, I have a little bit of code here that simply gives me sliders that I can exercise. So here we are, same plot as before, but now the red point is simply going to be beta times v. And since beta right now is zero, uh, beta times v is at the origin. The blue point will be at alpha times u. Again, it's equal to zero, so I'm at the origin. If I change alpha in small steps, uh, alpha times u plus zero times v is alpha times u. That's the line again. I can go from negative values all the way to the uh, positive values and trace out all of the points in that, on that line. Okay, so I'm at 5 times u for alpha. I'm going to start adding beta v to that. So right now I'm adding 0. But I'm adding a vector to alpha u in the direction of beta. So as I make beta bigger, this is what I see. I see the sum of alpha u plus beta v is actually a line in the direction of v at, that starts at the endpoint of alpha times u. Well, let's move it all the way up to the endpoint over here and fix beta. If I fix beta, I'm fixing the red vector, right? I'm fixing beta times v. Now, if I change alpha again, I'm going to trace out the line that alpha lies on, but pushed away from the origin by beta v. So I'm getting that top line. Let's fix alpha again and start changing beta. If I change beta, well, now I'm modifying my direction, uh, the, the amount of push away from the blue line, from the uh, blue vector, I'm getting the uh, line over here. So if I change alpha again, I hope I'm convincing you that what I'm doing is I'm going to be tracing out the parallelogram defined by the limits that I'm putting on alpha and the limits that I'm putting on beta. So here's my uh, minus 5 alpha, minus 3 beta, and in the opposite direction, plus 3 alpha, plus 3 beta. So a point here to a point here. All the points in this parallelogram I can reach. If I change alpha and beta so they, they go from minus infinity to plus infinity each, the parallelogram grows to, to encompass the whole plane. If I have more dimensions, more vectors, okay, I might be in more than two dimensions with this quote, flat construction of adding vectors. And the way to think about it is it's still akin to a plane. We'll simply call it hyperplane. It's a flat object in more than three dimensions. So spans of vectors are hyperplanes. So the big takeaway for today, therefore, are, first of all, we have two very important definitions. A linear combination of vectors, pick an alpha and a beta, uh, alpha u plus beta v, that's a linear combination. And the span of vectors, all the possible linear combinations I can get by changing the numbers I'm multiplying my vectors. Second, the algebra of vector and matrix addition and scalar multiplication. It works exactly the same as addition and multiplication of scalars. So we don't really have anything new here. The other uh, big example that we had, let me go back to it to uh, show you which one I'm talking about here. We started with a set of hyperplanes. And we took that set of hyperplanes. Uh, here it was just actual planes since I was had uh, three variables. We changed that set of hyperplanes to a new form, to a linear combination of vectors equal to some constant right-hand side. So we have this 
fact that we can take a, a set of equations of hyperplanes and transform them into a set of equations uh, that uh, simply are the linear combination of vectors is equal to some constant vector. The third remark I want to make is that scalars 0, 1, and minus 1 are quite special. If I start with a vector u, 0 times u, scalar 0 times u, is the 0 vector. So on the right, it's a vector. With 1, 1 times u is just a vector u. And with minus 1, minus 1 times u was our additive inverse. u plus minus 1 times u is u minus u is equal to the zero. The last big takeaway was the geometry of spans of vectors, that if I have a span of vectors, I can think of them as a hyperplane.